Hello, guys, and welcome back to another episode of Tech Talk with Ethan. And today I'm here with Amanda Spooner, who is a stage manager. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun. No problem. Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, so my name is Amanda Spooner. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am joining you from Ithaca, New York, uh, which is the native lands of the Cayuga Nation, the Haudenosaunee, and the Susquehannock. I am an equity stage manager. I serve on council at Actors Equity Association. I am also the assistant professor of stage management, the only professor in stage <laughs> management, it's just my title, um, at Ithaca College, uh, where I'm launching a BFA program in stage management in the fall. And I uh, am still working as a stage manager from time to time. Um, in March of 2020, I was on the Broadway musical Sing Street, and we were in our fifth hour of tech uh, when everything paused. So that's what I was doing. And I'm also the vice chair of the Stage Managers Association, and I work with the Parent Artist Advocacy League in addition to being the founder and I guess administrator of Year of the Stage Manager 2020 slash 21, which is a campaign that was built to celebrate stage managers and educate people about what we do. And I'm the mom of a four-year-old, which I think is worth mentioning because you might hear him in the background from time to time. Definitely. Wow, that's that's a lot to a lot of information right there at the beginning, but thank you for that. That's <laughs> it is a that's uh, awesome. So many titles. Yeah, it's a lot of titles. I'm always afraid I'm missing one and I probably am, but um, it was my goal that, you know, before I turn 40, I'm 38 now, um, but before I turn 40 to really uh, just dive in and um, fill my brain and my soul up with as much as I could, and then I uh, get really specific about things after I'm 40. So that's my goal. I really wanted to make 40 something to embrace and not something to fear, you know, because yeah. in- film and television and media it's always like wow 40 and I'm like, oh, <laughs> yep so I think yep. it's exciting so that's that's sort of my timeline good yeah I mean you know age is age happens and you know that's it's good <laughs> that you have a bucket list sort of to to check things off you know and you get things done it's great yeah, exactly. it's my bucket list <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's funny um could you uh could you explain how you got into stage management and technical theater Sure, absolutely. So I uh, have always had a broken no button. I am a Gemini, uh, very much a Gemini, and I like to do a little bit of everything. And so when I was five years old, I was a singing blueberry muffin in a riveting musical about Thanksgiving. And I was also, you know, throughout my childhood and teenage years, a softball player. I played the clarinet, I played basketball, uh, volleyball, I played golf, I played tennis, I did every sport except for soccer. Um, I was a cheerleader for one year that was kind of a disaster. I danced. Um, I did, I was in 4-H. I was a Girl Scout at student council. I like truly did everything, which is, shouldn't be shocking at this point, this in these depths of our, our time here. Um, mm. I'm pretty, pretty much the same human that I was when I was, you know, 13 basically. Yeah. Um, but as time went on, things sort of like fell along the wayside. And eventually the thing that was left standing was theater. And I had auditioned for a play called Arcadia by Tom Stafford in my senior year. And I was always cast in the fall plays. And I uh, went to go read the list because it was 1990. Oh, wait, I can do it. I guess it was 1999 and I went to go read the list on the door outside of the theater because not everyone had the internet. I don't even know mm -hmm. that I had an email account that I used, wow, um, but wow. I went to go read the cast list. I know, right? So, so, so long ago. But when I read the cast list, I wasn't uh, listed. And I like, it was like in the movies where they like go down a list, yeah. and they, like follow <laughs> their finger. And it said stage manager, Amanda Spooner. And I was like, what the hell is that? And um, it turns out that there is a tortoise in the show. And my family has a pet desert tortoise uh, who's a living family heirloom. My grandparents had him in the 50s and he will outlive us all. What? And I think that's, I know, right? His that's crazy. Tortoise. Yeah, he's cool. He's super cool. And um, he's probably hibernating right now, but he's cool. And um, yeah, so I was like, oh, that must be why I've been made this mysterious thing called the stage manager because I have the pet that's needed for the show. Um, my mom was like, no way are you using 
uh, our pet in the show. <laughs> I was mm-hmm. like, okay. But I still got to be the stage manager and I really had no idea what I was doing, but I caught on pretty quickly that the role of a stage manager is to be present and uh, be responsible for the things that are needed in order to rehearse and perform the show. And I'm being very vague on purpose because my wonderful high school drama teacher didn't really have a specific definition either. So I would just show up and do things that seemed like somebody needed to do them. And then the next show I did, I was like, maybe if I think about these things before they happen and I like preemptively put some things in place to like make rehearsal easier, that Mm -hmm. would make sense. And so slowly but surely it's like I gained some knowledge about how, you know, we commonly think of theatrical stage management nowadays. So that that's my origin story in stage management. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. So like, did you take any like technical theater classes in high school before just being thrown into that role? Not really. I mean, I took theater classes ever since I, you know, was a a freshman or a first year student in high Mm -hmm. school. And yeah, I think maybe I took theater every year. It's, you know, it, It was long enough ago that I like don't really remember what my schedule was, but um, I'm pretty sure that I took like a theater class every fall because I wanted to. And um, it wasn't, I think only one of them was required in the curriculum, but it wasn't a technical theater class. I mean, truly Carol Hovey, who was my high school drama teacher, who I think still works at that high school. She was a one person operation and Mm -hmm. She, you know, directed and uh, I think it was mostly directing at like a local theater that was an amateur theater, Um, but she was, she was amazing. She's a force. And I think that she inspired me in a lot of ways, especially now that I'm an educator. Um, I find myself, you know, at two o'clock in the morning carrying like huge boxes of things like to and from my car. And I'm like, right. (laughs) I basically turned into my high school drama teacher, except for where I work, there's an amazing faculty that, you know, stretches out far and wide beyond just a one person operation. But I am, I am, like I said, the only stage management uh, professor at IC, which is, is fine. Like for the size of the the program right now, it makes, it makes sense. Um, But I do, I find myself doing things. I'm like, Oh, it just reminds me of my high school drama teacher yeah that's 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 interesting Uh, so so you started you started a program at uh the college right yeah so at Ithaca College uh when I was hired in I guess I started in the fall of 2018 um when I was hired uh it was a new position to uh, assistant professor of stage management and I when I was hired, they were really hopeful that I would help design a BFA program that had to go through an approval process. So over the past, you know, five semesters, we went through the approval process and it was official at the beginning of this semester. And so it, um, there are students transferring over into it that are already students at Ithaca College. Um, we've always uh, really, you know, since I've been there and, and before I arrived, there have always been strong stage managers that come out of the program. They just weren't mm-hmm. specifically in a BFA program. So we kind of for the last five semesters have been acting like it's a BFA program, but it it had not been made official with curriculum. So now now it's going to be, which is great. And we are taking applications now. I have a feeling that deadline will be extended. Um, Right now it's currently December 1st is the deadline for applications. And it's purposefully, just in case anyone's curious, um, it is purposefully uh, really just a, a written statement. There's no requirement to provide a you know portfolio or a resume you can provide those things if you want to in your application um, but I think that there's going to be people who come into the program that have experience being you know stage managers or theater technicians or theater artists in high school and there's going to be some people who don't have that and really the program's built for and welcoming of everyone you know mm-hmm. exactly how did you how do you know how do you uh How'd you find you wanted to be an educator? How'd that come about? Uh, When I was little, I used to teach my stuffed animals with my chalkboard and, you know, in my bedroom and um, I really, my dad uh, is not a teacher, but he was always, you know, my softball coach and, um, he was always very patient and teaching me about things and very curious about the world. So I think I got a lot of that from him and um, I really loved my teachers when I was little. So it was just something that I figured I would always end up doing. Um, But the timeline of when that would happen was a bit mysterious because as I learned more about the field I wanted to go into, I was 
very determined to have professional experience before I became a full-time educator, which I did. I had a, a and still do, had a wonderful, um, you know, career where I was, you know, fully a uh, career stage manager. And now, you know, I, I'm doing virtual projects. I have one coming up. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, you know, my focus is on, on education and I'm excited about that. So yeah, I think it's because I was really lucky to have both a father who, you know, was really educational in his own way and then wonderful teachers and stuffed animals who would st sit still long enough for me to teach them my really deep curriculum when I was, you know, five years old or whatever yeah. it was maybe. That's, that, that's, that's really, that's, that's funny, but that's, it's cool. You have that, you have that passion and it has carried over into this thing. Now you have carried out, which is great. Yeah. I think education is really powerful. And I think that education, uh, when used responsibly, it doesn't need to take place in a formal setting. Education happens everywhere, all around us all the time. Um, but I think it's really powerful. I think when people are educated, you know, about like COVID, for example, I think they're able to keep themselves safer and um, hopefully able to care for themselves in a way that's safe for their mental health and their spiritual health as well. Um, education, you know, makes that makes the world go round really in a lot of ways. And so, um, yeah, I just really believe in the power of that. And I believe in, you know, having access to it as well. So I, I totally agree being, being a student, you know, especially. I, <laughs> like, I hope sure. you like education otherwise. Yes. I mean, it, it, I think it'd be, it could be challenging, right? But I think, I think overall, you know, the, the, the message I think is good, you know, in general. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's dive into stage management a little bit more. Um, could you, could you explain like, what are the steps you do, you, you take as a stage manager when you are doing a show? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that stage managers are best serving themselves and the project when they go about figuring out the why before they go about figuring out the how. So why are we doing this piece? And how they answer that question is by listening to the designers and the director and the playwright, whatever team is you know working on the show, because sometimes the playwright's not around, right? Um, but if they're listening to uh, their fellow creators, because I do think that stage managers are artists, um, if they're listening to the people who are driving the, the vision of the show, um, like the director talk about the show, I think that's really important, right? So I think stage mm -hmm. managers, as soon as they get assigned to a show or they're hired for a show, they should read the play or read the book of the musical and listen to the music, whatever is existing as far as the content is concerned. Um, and I think they should read it and not take notes, like just read it, listen to it, be with it, let it into your soul. Um, and again, like a detective, like go in, you know, in the depths of figuring out like why why this? Why now? What's the story we're trying to tell? Um, mm -hmm. Because you really have to leave yourself open to joining that collaboration and not being a logistical outsider, you know? Um, and I think stage managers who miss that step of absorbing the why and go straight for the how, I think they other themselves and they're always sort of outside of that collaboration. Um, and it's really investigating that material as much as you can. Like I was saying, you know, my second show that I did in high school, it's like, how, you know, what can I do before rehearsal to really preemptively figure out like how to support that process and what needs to be in the room? You know, how can I be proactive about seeing, uh, you know, what's coming down the road? People mm -hmm. sometimes refer to stage managers as being psychic. I'm like, no, I want more credit than that. That's not me being psychic. That's me actually like using yeah. my instincts and my practice and my experience to, you know, prepare a room so that storytelling can can happen in there and discoveries can be made. And I think Definitely. it's really important in process to uh, really do that research and prep for your process as much as you can. So if you've done all the prep that you can possibly do, then you're ready for stuff to change because it's going to change. It always changes, right? And you can't be too uh, really married, you know, to what you think it was supposed to be or what people said it was going to be. But the more you prepare for what you know going into a process, then you, I think your hands are free and your head is free um, for you to catch the change that's coming your way and then process it in whatever way it needs to be processed. Definitely, definitely. So it's like for things like, so like prep, right? So like you said, like, so like cue sheets, how do you, how do you go about writing those? I mean, I don't. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I don't typically, I mean, I think that if I'm working as like an assistant stage manager on something, then I'm writing uh, what's sometimes called the deck or the run sheet. And so there will be scenic cues or um, actor entry cues in there. But in my, my professional experience, um, I'm, you know, maybe I've organized like a cue sheet that has projections on it. Like if the projections are going to have text or content in them. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I can't think of I can't think of the last time that I as a stage manager provided someone with a cue sheet, but I think that it's, you know, making a contact sheet, right. in a calendar. Yeah. Um, those are what I call calibrating pieces of paperwork. So like, no matter what you do, if you like walk into a show, you've been hired that morning and you're like, I don't even know where to begin, read the play, <laughs> but then yeah. make a contact sheet in a calendar, right? Because people are going to use that so they can find the people and they know when they're supposed to be doing things. Right. So those are, those are two like binding, they're like glue, right? The yeah. information that's in there. Um, and then it's about doing, I think, a script or production analysis. Um, my students at Ithaca College do that. Uh, It's a pretty common thing to do. Um, So once you read the play, then you go about being a forensic detective, right? And like, what are all the things that I can find from the dialogue? What are all the things I can find from the stage directions that I'm going to put into a grid, if that's what your style is, Mm -hmm. put into a grid so that I can actually like take it and wring it out, right? Take the script and wring it out and get all the information out of it until my hands hurt, right? And get all that information out of it. And then you start like scooping that information out and putting it into things like a character scene breakdown so that you know which characters are in which scenes. Um, A prop list, you start making your deck sheet and you looking at the documents that are being provided from designers as well, like uh, ground plans and renderings and costume sketches and stuff like that. That that seems like a lot in, you know, seems like a lot to, to have before a show, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. It's remarkable, though, how much you can do before a show, because you also have to send out, at least in most professional theatrical spaces, you do need to send out a daily schedule every day, and you need to send out a rehearsal report every day. So there's so much you can do before you get to the end of your first rehearsal, and you have to make a schedule for day two or send a report out about day one. There's all this stuff that you could have done to prepare for that moment. So you're not sitting there and like formatting it in that moment. Yeah, Um, You can preemptively make your distribution list in your gmail account um technology is amazing we've come a long way since 1999 right so there's a lot of stuff that you can do um for yourself and i call it doing favors for your future self right and then you most often hopefully have a stage management team so if you're the production stage manager or the head of that stage management team it's about setting up your team for success um successful communication amongst yourselves and then successful communication with everyone else around you because that is a big part of being a stage manager right for sure for sure so have you have you found yourself like before show right like you know that prep work have you found yourself like falling behind being like oh I have to do this but I haven't done this yet and you'd be like you know stressing out you're like I need to get this done right but I haven't done it yet yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I think we've all gotten ourselves into places. I think it's, I think it's actually really easy to do it right now during yeah. uh, this, what I call the great pause. Nothing is really paused, right? It's like yeah. the world stopped turning, but everybody kept moving around on it. <laughs> um, That was deep, but yeah, it's, I think that it is uh, really, you know, allowing us to let things accumulate. <laughs> So it's like, yeah. oh, here's all of these things that are in a pile. And I don't feel so motivated, like spiritually or mentally to start like chipping away at that pile. And I think that you really have to think about taking like little bites, right? Like what are the favors I can do for my future self, right? So my future self is like, please don't let that pile get bigger. And I'm like, right, right, right. Sure, sure, sure. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, But also I just think that it's, you know, my mom used to say this to me and it sounds weird when I say it, so forgive me, but it's like, how do you go about eating a piano one key at a time, right? So if you're going to like eat a piano, you can't just Mm -hmm. like swallow the whole piano. You have to do one key at a time. And I think it's about checking in with yourself on Honestly, and saying, okay, what are my goals? What are my immediate goals that I can accomplish? Like that I have the tools and the wherewithal to accomplish. Mm-hmm, and what mm-hmm. are some short-term goals that I want to work on like over a short period of time? And then what are 
are some long-term goals that I sort of want to point my ship toward? Um, and that if those change along the way, no big deal. But I think it's about finding a process, whether it's like shower thoughts or whatever it is, like finding a process in which you can check in with yourself and that you take the management of your own life seriously. And I have, because I have a lot of students and a lot of colleagues and friends that are like, oh, this COVID thing, like, I don't feel like I'm getting anything done. And I'm like, I think it's because you're staring at the mountain. And like most mountain climbers, I don't know, not a mountain climber, but I imagine they're not like constantly leaning back and being like, damn, this is big. I think they're like looking at what's in front of them. Um, so it's about perspective and it's about being able to zoom out, lowercase z, zoom out and like zoom back in. And um, again, just creating that space for yourself. But sir, sure, there have been times where I was like doing three shows at once that I'm I'm like, this does not feel prepped at all, but you have to be able to take a snapshot and then like figure out what the highest priority is at any given time. And I think that's a skill that you can develop in formal and in informal educational settings. Um, but I think it's also learning from experience and saying, oh, I prioritized the wrong things in that moment. And how did I get to that point where I prioritized the wrong things, you know? So again, it's being forgiving of yourself and, and checking in. Yeah, that that's a really interesting analogy. The the piano one, I, I've never heard that. It's I mean, it seems it, it's, <laughs> it's interesting, <laughs> but I think it makes you think, right? Like it makes you yeah. think of like, you know, like do things that you know, like take take your time and actually, you know, do things, you know, the way you want them done in a way, sort of, you know. Yeah, you, know. you have to like you have to be patient with yourself, and I think that that's you know when you're looking at the thing as a whole like you're like oh god this is impossible but like really if you know 2020 taught us anything it's that anything is possible right like you can truly expect anything to happen and so if you're like it's not possible for me to ever be prepared for this rehearsal that I'm going into tomorrow take a snapshot what's the highest priority start to prioritize and then just remember 2020 proved that anything is possible for better or worse right here we are yeah yes talk could continue on the stress we're talking about stress sort of right um how, how how do you manage your stress doing a show yeah I mean it's I don't I think there is a common misconception that stage managers are just endlessly stressed out right mm -hmm, so yeah I don't, I just, I think because I really do invest in prepping as much as I can and then mentally and spiritually preparing for all of it to change and giving myself tools to deal with that change. And sometimes that prep is not as full, right? Or like as yeah. complete as we want it to be, um, but how to do those favors for my future self. So when I get into tech, I just, I'm so excited to be in tech whenever the opportunity presents itself, whether yep. it's virtually or venue-based. And so these like cartoons that float around the internet and these like sort of misrepresentations like on, you know, episodes of the Golden Girls of like grumpy stage managers that are always stressed. I'm like, I just, I mean, certainly there are stressful points and the job has a lot of responsibility and maybe I've been doing it long enough that it just doesn't feel stressful anymore because it feels like it's in my wheelhouse mm -hmm. um, but yeah I don't I don't know I it's just, it's thrilling it's like riding on the front of a comet you're sitting in the intersection of things that a group hopes to do um you know intersecting with the things that they're actually able to do I mean it's it's exciting and so I don't I don't know it doesn't I mean, I'm not really answering your question, but I guess I just wanted to take a moment on your show to say that that is a misconception that stage managers are constantly stressed out. I think it's it's being perpetuated in media <laughs> in a way yeah. that I wish people would stop. But I also think it's acknowledging that the job has a ton of responsibility attached to it. And so if you shy away from responsibility, if you don't even like having a goldfish, then like maybe it's not the path for you because it does <laughs> it does really, you know, people I think are most successful in stage management when they are happy to be sort of in the middle of everything and to to accept the fact that things might not be their fault, but they can instantly become their problem. <laughs> you know, and go yeah. like, wait, 
how are we going to solve this? And also know that your approach is going to set the tone for the room. And that's a responsibility that I think is under articulated sometimes, especially in educational programs, like who, who you are, like, you don't have to walk around with a smile on your face all day long. Right. We're trying to get rid of, rid of that. Right. But it's, you know, maybe you do want to, but it could just be like, are you taking the work seriously? And that's going to set a tone for the people around you. Are you taking yourself too seriously? That's also going to set a tone for the people around you. And I think even though stage management is considered a middle management position, it actually has a lot of perceived authority attached to it. And I think it's because of the responsibility um, and the expectations that people have of stage managers. So sometimes it's stressful. Um, I just like to take time to, I guess, I like to go for walks. I like to go running. Um, I really like uh, listening to music and, and audible you know, books, books on tape is yeah. what we used to call them. Um, and I, when I'm where my car is, I like driving my car. There are certain things I like to do, but I also, like I said, I'm a Gemini. So I really love being around people, um, which has been tricky, but I'm doing yeah. it on Zoom, right? Um, but it's, I really like being around people. And so I think that's the other thing that as, as stress builds throughout a process, I think just the, the collaboration is meaningful to me. And also going out with people who are not, in the theater, like make friends who are not in the theater, right? Yeah. Have some perspective <laughs> about, Definitely. about the industry that you're in um, and have some things that you enjoy in life. And if you like being around people and you're doing it safely, um, then, you know, find ways to do that and definitely highly recommend doing it with people who don't, uh, you know, feel the same stakes, right. Or gravity about what it is you're doing. They're always, they, sometimes I have friends that are so detached from theater that they're like, what are you working on wicked? And I'm like, nope, never. <laughs> they're like Lion King. I'm like, nope, there are actually more shows in the world than wicked and Lion King. And they're like Hamilton. And I'm like, yep. nope, not working, not working on Hamilton. dreams, dreams, goals in the future. We, we, we you know, I mean, I, I would, I, me personally as a tech would love to work on, you know, any big Broadway show, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter, sure. but you know, I mean, not everyone has those same dreams though, just to say, and to, you know, for your listeners to know that I really love working on new plays and musicals. And I never really, I mean, I was like, if Broadway happens, it happens. Um, but I was more interested in the content. And so there's theater that happens everywhere. I love that. That's your goal. Uh, Wicked is a, a technical spectacular. And so for anyone who loves technical theater and loves stage management or performing or whatever the case may be, those shows are amazing. And they are the kinds of shows that stay with people for their entire lives. You know, people are just hopelessly devoted to things like Wicked. Um, but for me, I really like experimental uh, theater, um, lowercase e, right? Like not as a genre, yeah. but just things where, where people are trying sort of off the beaten path as it were. Um, ideas and trying to tell stories that haven't necessarily been told. Um, and that's sometimes they end up on Broadway and that's great. And I like getting paid on Broadway because it's a big paycheck and I love the people that work on Broadway and I love the scale of Broadway. Um, but it's, it hasn't, it's not necessarily my goal. So I'm glad that you want to work on Wicked. I will go and I will watch it um, after I, you know, come uptown from whatever wacky rehearsal I was in downtown where there's like bunnies and cotton balls and roller skates. And, you know, maybe I'll be your neighbor on Broadway if it happens to go to Broadway but if it doesn't that's okay too because not every story belongs on Broadway for sure for sure and I, I think that's a great point I think that's a great place to end too thank you so much yeah. again Lauren uh for your for your great advice it was a pleasure talking to you yeah thanks for having me I really appreciate it and I hope uh you stay well and and uh good luck with all of this and let us know if you need anything you're the stage manager we're happy to support you thank you so much Amanda yeah thanks thank you guys yeah. Bye.